You are now listening to The Big Data Beard. Hi, everybody. This is Corey Minton with The Big Data Beard, and we are joined by one of our favorite guests, a perennial favorite from our listeners, Doug Merritt, CEO of Splunk. Doug Merritt, welcome to the IoT RV. Thank you, Corey. Very excited to be here. I'm just so impressed with what you guys have done <laughs> with this RV and the trip. It is what a great idea. It's a little bit crazy, but we had a lot of fun. You know, we love Splunk Conf. It's one of the best conferences of the year for us. Tons of learning, tons of excitement, so we're going to make it a little bit longer. So we drove this thing almost four, over 4,000 miles to be here. It's, well, it's comfy. It is. It is nice and comfy. Yeah. It's a little warm right now, but we're going to cool off whenever the sessions get started. So, Doug, you had a few weeks ago a major announcement, a lot of press around data to everything. Tell me a little bit about the vision behind this rebranding, this new messaging around data to everything. Yeah, it's, um, we were really excited about the event, and it's, it really has been four years in the making. Um, about four years ago, looking at the portfolio of where, where do we see the market going and where is Splunk today? Mm -hmm. um, we've got this amazing index and searching capability, and we've co-mingled structured, non-structured data within the index. And, um, but when you really looked out, where do we think the, the industry is going to go five, 10 years from four years ago? Mm -hmm. um, a whole bunch of new technologies were emerging that were super interesting. There's a whole movement around streaming and actually taking advantage of data as it's flowing across an organization outside of an organization. We see so many tools out there. You know, you, you guys are in the same advantage position of getting to talk to so many customers, and your data tools are exploding. Um, so how do you deal with data? People talk about silos and them being the enemy. What happens if there are a 1,000 silos or a million silos? And so we, we looked at the trends of consumerization, proliferating data, streaming capability, um, next generation immersive experiences like AR and VR. We started work on a ton of different new angles to complement what we're doing with the index and, and, the, and the search framework. Um, and we finally were launching a bunch of them at this conf on a production basis, you know, some last conf, uh, and really felt that we needed to crystallize more clearly for people who is Splunk today and where are we going? Um, are we just an index or are we more than an index and how are we complementing the index? And um, so we worked for a year on uh, what, what, how, do we, what even, how, do we, how would we even want to describe a category? And the best we could come up with, which I'm really excited about, but there was vicious debate, was we were really focused on bringing data to everything. Um, the index has always, been, has always been able to do that in a very flexible basis, but there's so many new complementary technologies that uh, really is possible to look at any source, any structure, any time scale, and help people put ideas into action through data. And that's what Data Everything was supposed to represent. That's very cool. Well, one of the things I, I always find interesting about Splunk is your maniacal focus on customers, right? And and so in this Data to Everything platform, I have to imagine that it was inspired in part by the use cases and the ways that people were using Splunk that really it did exactly that. It made it real about this data can be brought to everything. Was there any particular stories or any guests that you had on that Data to Everything platform announcement that you thought were really interesting that really embodied that Data to Everything message? Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a really fun event. Um, we got to have Barack Obama with us and interview him on what it did mean to him as a president, which was fascinating to hear all by itself. Um, but we, we wound up, there's an interesting juxtaposition we're dealing with, which is the core user communities and use cases that we've been powering on a more explicit basis um, surround cybersecurity and all their needs, the uh, data center and IT ops teams that have got the really onerous responsibility of keeping all these systems up, and the app dev and next generation dev ops teams. And you can see with acquisitions like Signal SignalFX and VictorOps and Omniscient and others that we're really trying to lean in and triple down and we're doing with app dev and dev ops. Um, we're not taking the eye off of those use cases. However, what we've seen and, and all of our amazing customers have shown us is data is data. And as you're grabbing data for those core buying centers, that exact same set of data can be used for almost anything that you put your imagination to, which is what data to everything is supposed to represent. And so there's this tug and pull of, we need to uh, help organizations continue to think through how to advance behind beyond those technical use uh, core use cases, but not lose sight of the importance of those technical use cases. So to bring those to life, we uh, had New York Presbyterian Hospital uh, as one of the presenters. I was talking about how they're using uh, Splunk to help with prescription drug abuse and, and uh, more specifically the op opioid crisis that we keep reading about. And it's 
just done dev devastating things across the nation. Um, but then also patient uh, medical record security. Um, I didn't know that it was as rampant as it was, that it was easy to actually, from different hospital personnel, to tap into data and potentially sell it and, and make a, a side business on our own personal data. Um, we wound up uh, with a whole host of manufacturing examples, not-for-profit examples, manufacturing a lot like what you guys do with this RV, how do you instrument very complex process and discrete manufacturing processes so you can actually uh, have the same degree of insight investigation, monitoring, and predictive analytics on manufacturing activities. Um, we highlighted the Global Emancipation Network um, and uh, a, a brand new organization we just uh, funded through our uh, societal impact fund that's trying to prevent wildfire, the wildfire issue around California and, and really across the nation and, and different parts of the world by, again, bringing a vast array of data, both from sensors, weather data, geospatial data, to try and become more quickly aware of, of wildfire and then understand its uh, fuel materials and course and wind directions they can try and get in front of it. So lots of really interesting use cases in addition to the fascinating use cases we have with security, app dev, and, and IT ops. Absolutely. And one of the things I, I, I read in, in the announcement was that you've, you're making a bet on the future with uh, this funding of a kind of a ventures fund. Help me understand why making that bet and investing in this, you know, the startup ecosystem and partner ecosystem, why that's important for Splunk in terms of innovation and growth. Yeah, two, there are two funds, a $100 million innovation fund, which is a, more of a classic, I think, try and find anyone anywhere that wants to build an app and, and likely sell it to make money on it. And then a societal impact fund that you know, still will have some IR and internal rate of return characteristics, but is really focused on how do we help the world around us. Um, and as, as all of you know, we've had Splunk Base for say eight, eight years now, and there's now over 2,000 apps on Splunk Base. We've had an ecosystem out there, um, but 2,000 is a great number, but why aren't there 20,000 or 200,000 or 2 million apps? There's any problem can be enhanced by bringing data to the problem. So what do we do to help evangelize the opportunities out there? And in addition to all the partnering activity that we do constantly, as you guys are a good example of, um, we really want to put our uh, money where our mouth was and make it clear to folks that we are here to help with that innovation cycle. And whether it's helping re-educate people, um, create economic opportunity, deal with climate change, deal with any type of human um, uh, problems like the uh, trafficking issue that Global Emancipation Network deals with, or whether it's building the next cool uh, supply chain optimization or uh, internet fraud or um, uh, manufacturing optimization application, um, that we are there with not just our people, not just our software, but with the ability to invest to help organizations with that innovation. I love it. Well, you know, you hit on earlier that you had a chance at this event to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a few hundred people watching, but a one-on-one -on -one conversation with former President Barack Obama. What, what if for our listeners that weren't able to attend, what wisdom or what kind of single kind of thread did you pull from uh, from President Obama? Yeah, I went up. Um, my favorite blog is a blog I I uh, had with uh, the, recounting the the Barack Obama piece, um, and the the thing that I walked away with that really struck me is he no matter what people feel about his policies and his administration. And um, he really represents and represented someone who is trying to take a very balanced approach and a very data-driven approach. Um, and what I felt when he was present and, and we got to talk a lot about was how did he separate uh, signal from noise and what tacti tactics did he use both with his C you know, first governmental CIO and first chief data officer, but then also uh, how did he actually manage his staff so that he got enough diversity of opinion so that you could have people that were not just analyzing data, but taking different views and perspectives. And then what do you do on more of a day in day out basis to try and pull information from people? And one of my favorite stories that wasn't in the blog uh, was the, for a lot of the big important meetings, you'd have like the joint chief of staff, you'd have all the you know, very decorated people right around the table, but on the outside were all the staff folks that did a ton of the work. 
Um, and he started to make a habit of randomly calling on staffers that were freaked out the first couple of times he did it. And then they realized that he actually really wanted their opinion. Yeah. And he would say, oh, so Richard, I know that you helped work with the general on this. You know, yeah. what, what would you do? And how? It, and I thought that was one of those great common practices that we all, you know, you, we all should be intent on truth seeking. And the closer you can get to the ground, um, to, the, to the reality, to the customer, to the use case, the better information you get back. And it was just another good reinforcement of practices that I think many of us try to do all the time, which is uh, get as accurate of information as you possibly can. That's awesome. Well, one of the things that I think is, you know, has attracted a lot of people to Splunk beyond the fact that, you know, it's this incredible technology that has gone from being a cool startup that was an indexing tool to, you know, even the analysts are saying will be an enterprise like required kind of kind of platform to deal with the modern enterprise. So how do you as CEO guide a company through that and maintain this culture that is, you know, we, we talked about this RV, they liked the idea of it because they said it was splunky enough, right? <laughs> how, do you, how do you maintain that culture that keeps people not only excited about the technology, but being excited about being part of the community? Well, we are um, we are honored that we have the opportunity to become a required piece of technology, and there and what we know is every single day we've got to earn it. We've got to wake up and deliver for our customers, um, so that so that we have that so we can continue to have that opportunity. Um, we actually went through an exercise my first two months when when uh, we started the transition between Godfrey Sullivan and I, um, where I brought the exec staff together and we did, I couldn't believe it took two days, but forced everybody to write down what are the things that they thought were most important for the success of Splunk so we could get to a shortened list of our top corporate priorities. And it, it, it took full two days with lots of debates and wadding up paper and throwing at different people and um, to get to uh, uh, our three core priorities with customer success as the the first and boldest priority. And right behind that, world-class products. And right behind that, the you know, best and top talent we can possibly bring both within Splunk, but just as importantly across the ecosystem and, and within our customer base. Um, and I think that grounding in customers, um, that being competitor focused is interesting. Being customer focused, I think, is much more important. It's it's to, again much more that true north, just like we're trying to find with data. Uh, so we we work really hard to try and stay super centered on the customer to make sure that as we're bringing in people, they understand that. And it gets harder and harder as we get bigger, and more people become siloed. Not everyone gets to touch the customer as often as as they could. Um, but trying to maintain the duocracy, you know, that everyone can pick up any task anywhere in the company and jump on top of it and do something interesting. It doesn't have to be in their swim lane. Um, you know, we have done our one, one, one challenge around, uh, Splunk for good where everybody gets, uh, two days off per year to volunteer, to do whatever the heck they want to, for good around them, which is another form of inspiration that people could take. Um, but for me, the number one piece that, that we, I think need to continue to screen for is resiliency in grit and tenacity. Like I, I love, so many people that wind up being complete superstars are not the people that on paper you would pick. You know, they're not the MIT grads with three different PhDs, and um, which which is, you know, I, I certainly am not one of those, um, which goes back to, you know, what you need is the hunger, the curiosity, the intensity, the abil ability to bounce back if you really want to make a difference in the world. And um, if we're lucky, we'll keep finding ways to have as many of those people be part of the Splunk movement inside or outside of as plunk as possible. Very cool. Well, now we are at, like I said, the ex one of the most exciting conferences of the year for a lot of us technologists. Certainly the most exciting one for well, you, I'm you. guessing. I definitely, yeah. It's, yeah, my, it's my favorite week. week of the year. And you're a wildly busy guy. I know you're bouncing between keynote preps and a lot of stuff, but I want to get just some perspective because this uh, this is going to be published. People are going to listen to this like right before the conference starts. So what's the exciting things that people are going to hear and see at Conf? Like what are the top things that you're most excited to present? Uh, so Conf hopefully it still is and will remain a user conference. Mm -hmm. And going back to our priorities, customer success, number one, we've got a whole bunch of new customer success and professional services and education and other offerings, including the amazing volume of people that are going through Splunk University right now. Um, so everyone stay tuned and be on the lookout for what additional facilities are there with us, with our ecosystem and partners to make sure that you know how to advance your career, how to use the, all the new technology that's coming effectively. Um, right behind that, number two priority is product. I am so excited about this product roadmap. 
um, going back to the Data Everything launch, we've been working for, honestly, for four years um, nonstop on how do we continue to complement and surround the index. Um, I cannot wait for people to really get their hands on a production version of our data stream processing product, um, which I think is unparalleled in the industry, both on the volume it can handle. Now, we all know that any type of transport messaging technology winds up with issues on bottlenecks. You know, as you're thinking about petabytes of data flowing across organizations, while Kafka and Flink are awesome raw technologies that we've surrounded DSP around, and I know that doesn't sound like Splunk, you know, embracing open source. I mean, ah, excited about open source. It's a wild source. It's, there's so much that you have to do around those projects mm -hmm. to make sure that they can scale and be managed the way they need, they need to. So DSP, I think, will radically change the game for our customers. Um, our federated search product, DFS, again, it, based on Spark, another crazy concept to bring in an amazing open source project. But the amount of work that the team had to do, both of those are 40-plus development teams have been working for three-plus years almost four years in these products. We have 44 patents that have been filed on DFS. I forget how many granted now, I think 15 to 20 granted. And we had to rewrite huge chunks of the core source code libraries so that we could actually get it to operate and perform the way that we needed to for this super high speed, federated high cardinality search capability. Um, I love all the new um, ease of use interfaces that we have. We're finally releasing an updated version of our natural language processing capability, continuing to enhance our machine learning toolkit. Um, we've got some great announcements around our mobile framework with AR being released and VR and beta. Um, Every, our business pro, our business flow product that automatically renders um, the data that's flowing through the Splunk index in a process flow view. Um, we all know that as soon as you set a system loose, whatever you blueprinted it to do, it starts to change from that second forward. So how do you get a real-time view of where the bottlenecks and opportunities for efficiencies are? And we just, we've tried to attack the problem every way we possibly can from scale, data processing, you know, sub-millisecond uh, monitoring and response um, to all the way through to how do you get non-technical users to be as efficient and as effective as our highly data savvy and technical users. Absolutely, yeah, democratization of the capability I think is incredibly important. We're seeing it in lots of pockets of technology, but you know, that's the beauty. Any, any technology that gets you know, appropriately mature, it starts to feel more like magic because we've made it easy for everybody. I love that. Now, one thing that is still a piece of technology that I've struggled with is blockchain, but I heard you guys are doing some digital currency here at Comp. <laughs> Tell me about the, is it the uh, Buttercup Bucks? Is that the what it's called? Buttercup Bucks, yep. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah we, uh, we took one of our most innovative guys, we have so many, we took one of our many, many, many innovative folks, uh, Nate McCurvey, and, and put him on the, he self-elected, he was jumping up and down and put him on the uh, blockchain initiative a year and a half ago or so. Um, and so we've got a whole host of stuff he, he's been working on. Just when you think about blockchain as uh, technology and what it can do, how do you even monitor blockchain? Not a people, a lot of people have taken that angle. And then how can you use a distributed ledger to capability to have higher trust and assurance around data? So I think two very Splunk centered excuse me, approaches to blockchain. Um, but then there was that uh, idea of why wouldn't we create, create our own cryptocurrency for uh, the Splunk for Good and the donation side of life. So uh, again, there's some interesting things that people will see on how do you drive purpose with data um, that uh, we're, we're excited to announce over the course of these three days and get everybody involved in using their imagination and the art of possible for how we can impact key causes that we need to impact for the health of the world, our species, and other species that we cohabitate with. Yeah, well, pulling on that same thread of, of doing good things for the world and the people around us. I noticed that there's a lot of focus on diversity and inclusion activities here. And I, I think Splunk, you guys have always done a great job of making this a very welcoming conference. But tell me a little bit about what you're doing in the diversity and inclusion areas and kind of what the focus is for those sessions. Yeah, it's um, we started with a real focus on gender diversity a few years ago and, and self-published our, our metrics, which we weren't thrilled with. And we still feel like there's a long way to go. Um, but on the mantra of what gets measured gets done and data can solve all the problems without making it visible and transparent, you can't work on the problem. 
Um, last year, we really started focusing on more of the underrepresented minority aspect and blending it in with gender. Um, and so there, there's a, a whole host of, of uh, employee groups across Splunk now that are open to non-employees as well to help uh, drive awareness, visibility, um, and solutions on how do you make sure that you've got a, as diverse a workforce as you possibly can. Um, and those groups are in force at Splunk, and you'll see them woven through. There's a whole track on diversity and inclusion. You'll see them wo woven through um, all three days of Conf. Um, and again, it's it's such an interesting problem because depending on where you look at it from, it's a whole different problem. The diversity in Japan is different than it is in Germany, which is different than it is in California versus Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, and what what I know we care about, and I hope others do as well, is you ha we have to get better. We we've gone through waves in our every decade of the willingness to sit down and listen to people with other opinions. And we've become so divisive the past few years, which makes sense when there's so much overwhelming change and people feel uh, stressed. You know, stress is not usually a human friend, um, but we've got to get back to believing in the abundance of the universe and leaning in and making sure we get a chance to both learn from and understand other folks. Because there's almost no, no situation I've ever been in where if you just are willing to sit down and really, really listen, not having your head, I can't wait to rebut what somebody's saying because I know he's from a different position or she's from a different position. Um, that thing that you don't wind up with an improved position. Yeah. It's interesting. And you know, it's all this, all the story you just told is about it's bringing data to intelligent people so we can make decisions and learn and act. But those intelligent people are different. Like they come from all walks of life. And I think Splunk power in that, your investments in it, I think are encouraging. And I, I hope, I hope other tech technology companies take, uh, take encouragement from that and do very similar things. Doug, it's been awesome to have you on the Big Data Beard podcast. Before I let you go, I want to ask you a few questions that we like to call rapid fire. Absolutely. All right. So what's the last great book you've read that you'd recommend to our listeners? So uh, the book that I've been talking about for a year plus um, is Sapiens by Yuval Harari, but oh, yeah. he's got Homo Deus and 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. And he's just one of those really thoughtful people that, um, again, you know, there's always goods and bads in every philosophy, and but it really has had me sit back and think about the patterns across humanity. And we tend to go in these lemming-like fashions. I remember 10 years ago, everybody said cloud was a joke and it never happened. And now we're in this other realm where it's like, well, the only answer is cloud. And both of those are wrong. Going all the way back to how do humans work? We're distributed processing. There is no central processing, That's right. which is why you need a diverse collection of us to try and get multiple different viewpoints, which is a really powerful way to solve problems because cloud is so important right now. Everyone thinks that the only answer is centralization. And you need these massive training sets and Something like Sapiens helps you take a step back and think, is that is that necessarily true? It's certainly an advantage in some situations and others it's not. Um, but if you, for anyone that, if you want to short, anyone out there that wants to shortcut it, just go to YouTube, type in Yuval Harari or Sapiens and you can get a 30 to 45 minute uh, condensed version, but, but a really interesting book. I think it's worth the investment in time. I, I also read it and it's totally worth the investment in time. Uh, so you get to keynote uh, this conference as CEO, but I'm curious if you get to pick the song that's going to play <laughs> as you're walking on stage, what song is it you'd pick to walk on to? So, uh, my favorite walk up song ever was turned down for what? Oh, that I would love to bring back. <laughs> that is <laughs> awesome. That is hype. Yeah. That is like upper level hype. I like that. I think that was first SKO, uh, that, that I went up to that song. I, but yeah, it turned out. That makes me so happy. That's, I love the <laughs> fact that you said that. That makes me happy. Is there any particular shows you're binging on right now? Uh, so I don't, I, I grew up without being allowed to watch TV. Mm -hmm. So I was a book person mm -hmm. and the only two shows I've really allowed myself to get addicted to one's gone now, Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. Last season was not equal to the other seven. Um, and billions is the other one, which billions, is okay. fat. It's, it's, it's a cool one. Okay. I haven't gotten I, I know there's so many good ones out there. I keep getting told, um, Black Mirror and Weed and yeah. I, Westworld and I just I, now Westworld's one I will encourage. That one's a quality one. I would love to. Yeah, I gotta find the time. I'm just trying to make. But you have enough. a wonderful family, so yeah, spend exactly. time with them. So speaking of spare time, I know you're going to be crazy busy at Vegas this week. But if you had like a spare day to go have some fun in Vegas, what would you go do? Uh, so Lady Gaga is playing tonight. I think oh, that'd man. be a kick in the pants. Yeah. Um, not gonna be able to do that. Uh, and any Cirque du Soleil show. I just, I love what those guys do. It's, it, 
amazing what the human body can do. Totally, totally agree. Well, Doug, it has been awesome to have you on the Big Data Beard Podcast. Corey, Thank you so much for supporting us. I, I appreciate it. I love what you guys do. Thank you for everything that, that you do for everybody around you, including all the, the Splunk champions. Thanks for listening to the Big Data Beard Podcast. This amazing adventure would not be possible without our incredible sponsors. We thank you, Dell Technologies, VMware, Red River Technologies, Aero Electronics, and Converging Data for making the road trip to Splunk.conf 2019 possible. And be sure to smash that thumbs up button so we can keep the episodes coming. Until next time, keep being awesome.